presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, the massive oil slick in the Gulf of Mexico reminds us that our dependence on fossil fuels can come with some dire environmental consequences. But how to live more sustainably? That's our topic tonight on Dialogue. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. A welcome as well to those of you listening on public radio or streaming us on the World Wide Web. The world has an insatiable appetite for fossil fuels like oil, coal, and natural gas. Together they account for nearly two-thirds of the energy used in the United States and virtually all of our transportation fuels. Yet their extraction and use can come with high environmental and economic tolls, as we've seen recently with both the oil spill in the Gulf and mining disasters in the South. For more than 40 years, some have been warning that our use of such fuels, as well as the lifestyle they afford us, is unsustainable. We can actually do more with less, they argue, improving not only the planet, but also our emotional and physical well-being. Their mantra has caught on. The simple living movement has gone from rural communes to Main Street, popularized in a slew of magazines and even on Oprah. Going green is now cool. But what does it really mean to live more simply? Is it realistic? And what are the consequences if we don't? My guests tonight have steeped themselves in those questions. They're here to talk about the issues involved in the simplicity movement and hear your thoughts. Here in Boise is Dwayne Elgin. Mr. Elgin, an Idaho native and a College of Idaho graduate, authored one of the groundbreaking books about the simple living movement in 1981. That book was called Voluntary Simplicity. He's also the author of The Living Universe and Awakening Earth and a frequent speaker about sustainability issues. Welcome back to Idaho. It's good to be here, thank you. Sure, and joining us from our studio on the campus of the University of Idaho is Karen Lanfear. Ms. Lanfear, who has a doctorate in, ed in education, is the co-founder of the Sandpoint Transition Initiative. Part of the Transition Town Movement, the initiative aims to make Sandpoint, which is about an hour north of Coeur d'Alene, more sustainable in a variety of ways. Thanks so much for driving down to Moscow, Karen. Oh, you're welcome, it's my pleasure. Again, our topic is living simply. Have you made changes in your lifestyle to do with less? Or do you have a critique of the movement? Give us a call at 1-800-973-9800. Well, as I said, you grew up here. You grew up in Wilder, actually, Indeed. Mr. Elgin. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. up, did, growing up, wondering did growing up in Idaho have any effect on you and in, in your interest in this movement and these issues? Well, uh, growing up in Idaho in a small community of about 500 people, what I saw was community assistance, people helping one another. At the same time, it was a community of independent spirits. So it was a different kind of mindset, actually, of a strong community consciousness. At the same time, people were being very self-reliant. And it's that kind of spirit in many ways that the simplicity and sustainability movement is about. It's saying, let's be self-reliant. Let's take care of ourselves. At the same time, let's reach out to others and be a part of a larger community. Well, let's define it a little bit more because, you know, people have heard this phrase tossed about so many times. Yeah. It's almost lost its power in some ways. I know you feel there's some myths about quote, living simply or voluntary simplicity that yeah. in some ways have hurt the movement. Well, uh, it's been an evolving learning process as a society. And early on, people looked at uh, the simplicity movement. They said, well, look, it must be about going back to the land. Uh, leaving the city and uh, leaving the cars and all of that and going back to nature. And uh, what we now see, it's not going back to nature, it's really going back to human nature or in our own deep nature. And, um, and it's not leaving the city, it's rather making the most of where we are. And that's part of the learning that's happened over the last 30 or 40 years. So it's years. not, it's not uh, giving away everything. No. It's not uh, voluntary poverty. No, it, and that's one of the deep misconceptions. It's not about living li with less, it's about living with balance. And many people say, you know, my life, I'm just so busy, I'm crazy. My life is out of balance. And what we're saying, well, what do you need to do to get your life back in balance? Are you divided between your, your work life and your family life, between these uh, different parts of your life? How do you become whole here in this crazy, busy world? And that's what simplicity in many ways is about, becoming whole human beings. 
Mm -hmm. uh, before we go to Karen, um, why did you decide to update your book? As I mentioned in the introduction, it was written yes. in 1981, Voluntary yes. Simplicity. What prompted you uh, to update it? Well, we've gone from a time of relative complacency about all of this to a time of great urgency. We're facing a world in systems crisis, and it's time for us to step back from our everyday lives, take a hard look in the mirror, and, and look at what we're doing. Well, what, um, you mentioned that there's become more of a sense of urgency. So, um, as I understand it from reading your book, more and more and more people are actually doing this. Indeed, they are. They're measurably, uh, upwards of 25% of the American adult population is experimenting in more sustainable ways of living. Actually, it's much larger than that. But people are reporting higher levels of recycling and all the rest than they actually uh, demonstrate. But nonetheless, this is an underground significant movement movement that has just blossomed in the last 30 or 40 years. Now, one of the things you touch on in the book is the transition town movement. Yes. And as I mentioned in the introduction, we have Karen Lanfear with us from Sandpoint. Uh, she's driven to Moscow to be with us and uh, is the co-founder of the Sandpoint Transition Initiative, which is part of these transition towns yes. you mentioned in your book. Karen, tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about the transition town movement. It started in the United Kingdom, yes? Right. It started out as a classroom exercise in Kinsdale, um, Ireland, uh, and the teacher was Rob Hopkins, and he asked the class to, to look at the town they were living in and the, the aspects of the town and look at what would it take to create a more resilient and vibrant community there. Um, and after that, he went into depth going back to Totnes, which is where he's from, and the, the movement as the transition town movement started there in Totnes. And um, it started uh, five years ago, I believe, with him, and it is now spread all over the world. So there's 300 communities, active communities, many, many hundreds of others mulling over the idea. And in the United States, there are 65 official transition towns. And Sandpoint was the second in the United States, as I understand. Ketchum, actually, in Idaho, was the third. Uh -huh. uh, we've got some pictures from the night that you did your unleashing which was the night right. that you, you invited the community to learn more about Transition Town mm -hmm. Movement. And you, tell, us, tell us the purpose, give us more um, depth about the initiative. You want people to come together in right. different groups? Right, the, the, the purpose of the initiative is to unleash um, the creativity in the community so that we can come together, we can vision together, and then start working together to recreate a world that is more sustainable, has local um, economy at the center of it, and the vibrancy and resilience of the community as the, the measures of whether we're being successful or not. And we it's see a this way to take. We see a picture right now of the long emergency. So just so you know. Right. And and that's right. A the long emergency is the the convergence of those of peak oil, climate change, and the shattering of world economy. So. Um, that's the basic premise of transition. These are the reasons why we have to change the way we live. And so you've divided into some working groups in your community, yes? Correct. We had our big unleashing at the Panada Theater in downtown Sandpoint. And the next day we had 125 people show up to start creating working groups. And we created working groups for building and design, health, education, uh, and economy, uh, we have nine, we had 11 original working groups, we've got nine active working groups at the moment. And so the idea and would... they work in the different sectors. Mm -hmm. The idea would be each of these groups, as you mentioned, building and, and uh, I think there's local foods, would figure out ways to be more sustainable in Sandpoint? Correct. In that sector of society. So the, the difference between transition and other movements is um, twofold. One, it's based on raising awareness around the issues and the need to change and providing people with an opportunity to talk about it. And the other is building coalition with existing groups because in Sandpoint and all over the nation, there have been people working on these issues for a really long time. And this is just a way to bring them all together to share vision and direction. And why did you, why was it critical for you to found this in Sandpoint? What, what prompted you? Despair. <laughs> I was really, it was right at the end of, uh, it was January 2008, and I just felt so despondent about what was going on in the world, and I felt so um, unconnected to, to the, what was going on, and I, I found that I needed for my own well-being to find a way to commit back to my community. So um, 
the universe has a strange way of answering, mm -hmm. and I was uh, invited to a transition meeting um, two weeks later, and since then, that's what I've been doing. Great. And what would you say some of your major accomplishments are so far in Sandpoint? Uh, well, in Sandpoint, we've managed to raise awareness around a lot of issues. Um, the food, for example, we created a great partnership with the city of Sandpoint that's given us a park um, to create a community gardens. Mm -hmm. Those community garden people are now helping other groups like um, churches who are also interested in, in this and individuals and schools. So we're reaching out in the area of food and building our networks that way. Um, our building and design group has done a great job um, providing a green building tour for the mm -hmm. for people to see that green buildings are not strange. Um, creatures that they they can be very beautiful. Um, the education and art group has just created a folk school. So we have the first transition folk school in the United States, which is offering people an opportunity to learn and reconnect with the skills and arts and crafts of sustainable living. And one other thing I wanted to so, have you mention is, is in your community, you're doing something called asset mapping, which is interesting. And right. it, uh, explain that to people. Okay, asset map, the, the transition model is based on the assumption that we have what we need. We have the ingredients of our own success in communities, but so often we're disconnected from what those assets are. So asset mapping has to do with the various sectors, our various working groups, looking at and reaching out, finding out what the resources are in our community around those things, so that we start to build connections, start to build an asset map of what it is that we have, so that we can see ourselves in terms of our abundance and not in terms of our lack. So in other so words, we you would building, find out, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you would find out who the farmers mm -hmm. are, what kind of produce they're growing. Who the farmers are. Who, who has exactly. skills in a certain area. Now, would this be you know, used in, say, an emergency situation so that you know who to turn to for certain things in an in a emergency? Absolutely. Uh, w that wasn't one of the driving motives for us in Sandpoint, but there are many communities that are using that as the basis for developing their transition movement. Because, you know, how to come together in the face of an earthquake or a tornado. Because all of those resources, those are assets that you already have and people are already working together. It's just not acknowledged in the same way. Great, thank you very much. <coughs> so this transition, oh, just transition town movement is one of the things you mentioned in, the, in your book, just yep. one of many kind of new manifestations of the sustainable living movement. It is. Uh, yeah. It, it is. And people are saying in some respects, you can see this politically, they're saying we're not so sure we trust big government or big business and we're kind of taking life back into our own hands at the community level. And not only at the community level, down at the neighborhood level as well. And I think what we're beginning to see is in, in yeah. effect a kind of a new tribalism, a new neighborhood uh, movement. <laughs> um, where, where we say, we, we gotta work together here, we gotta pull together. And who do we know and what kind of skills can we pull together? So yeah, this is uh, integral to, the, uh, to sustainability. Uh, let, let me ask you, um, th this, is, this is kind of work, you know what I mean? She's got working groups going and you know, simple living isn't necessarily simple. That's right. And, and so you know, I think a lot of people, myself included, sometimes go, ugh, you know, like, I'm not going to bake bread from scratch and yeah. I'm not going to, you know, yeah. uh, bike every single place right. that I go. I mean, and it seems overwhelming to people right. actually to live more simply. It's right. easier to live materially. Yeah, I guess. In, in a way, we've structured our whole world, our whole economy and society around being good consumers. And if you're a good consumer, there's a certain uh, comfort to that. It moves along at a very fast pace, as we all know. Mm -hmm. And and so what we're saying, it's not so much about simplicity as living with less, once again. It's, I see people choosing simplicity, let's say they are families, and they're saying, I'm not going to expose my kids to the consumer machine and have them go through that and come out the other side as a good consumer. Other people say, you know, right. look at what we're doing to the earth, the oil slick that we see, what we're doing to other species and all the rest. And so they're motivated uh, by that. Other people uh, look at the world and say we need a new kind of economy here we need a green business and so they're oriented towards simplicity not so much out of let's say e ecology but rather out of economy and so there are many motivations that people have that are coming mm -hmm. to this uh, move to sustainability 
but sometimes don't people feel it's just so overwhelming? I mean, you know, the, oil, the oil slick. And so the things you're talking about, yes. they go, you know, it's, mm. a, it's a drop in the bucket, whether I recycle this can or yes. whether I, you know, eat a, a local tomato. Yes. I guess I'm playing devil's advocate here, but um, it, it, you know, one, by, one by one, it is a drop in the bucket. One by one, it is a drop in the bucket. But we are now seven billion people on this planet. And if one by one we begin yeah. making small changes, they are going to accumulate one by one into a tidal wave of change. I know we've got a call holding, I'll get to it in a moment, but you, you don't feel that, for instance, recycling, which has taken off dramatically yeah. in the last 30 years since you wrote your book, um, or changing your light bulb, for instance, to a right. more efficient light bulb or right. a, a more fuel efficient car, you don't see those as necessarily the, the centerpiece of living simply. No. No, I mean, that's just scratching uh, the surface because if we look at the challenges that we're facing as a human family on this earth, we are going to have to fundamentally mm -hmm. reconfigure how we live on this earth in many of the ways that were spoken about uh, around Transition Town and Sandpoint. So I think we're just at the very, very beginnings of a fundamental restructuring of how we live on this planet. And yeah. that, does that take government support to help happen, or just do you think it's going to happen naturally grassroots? Well, I think uh, governments are being very slow to react. I think uh, businesses are being very slow to respond. And I think what I take heart from is that people like Karen are stepping up and they're saying, you know, I was despairing, but instead I'm just going to step up and take care of this myself. And that is the power of resilient spirits in our democracy that I think is really going to make this work. Well, great. Let's take a call from mm -hmm. Earl in Albion. Earl, go ahead, please. Uh, I was just kind of wondering what your philosophy is on population growth, uh, at least sustainable population growth. Thank you very much for your question, <clears throat> Earl. Yes, I noticed that no. actually in, in your book that I didn't, I didn't see too much about. Say, it's very controversial, of course, population issues. Well, uh, I'll ask both of you how you yeah. feel about that. Well, I am deeply concerned about global population. In my lifetime, global population has tripled has tripled, and bef right. it's very likely it will quadruple so in we, my so, lifetime. So how do we deal with that? And, and the about? way to deal with that, my best understanding of the way to deal with that is by educating women and giving women health care. And it is not so much through directly through reproductive uh, uh, rights and such, but rather by giving young women education and access to health care, and that in turn is the foundation for a revolution in the third world. Karen? Um, I agree with him. I. I strongly believe that this is um, an inner as well as an outer journey. Uh, we, have to, we have to look at how we're living on the earth. People need to start th thinking of themselves in relation to the responsibility that that involves. And but if you're um, poor, if providing you're economic opportunities uh, for people to get an education. We know it's been proven time and time again that educating women and providing health care for women just starts changing that, that paradigm. And it's I very think that's one of the things we need to focus on. Yeah. It's very difficult because, of course, if you're poor, your children are your workers for you. So exactly. you, you have more children exactly. so that you can yeah. uh, get more money. Uh, let's take a call from Anna in Coeur d'Alene. Anna, go ahead, please. My comment is, uh, as in your involvement with um, recycling, has anyone thought about the use of disposables in our hospital industry across the, mm. the nation. You mean like all the gloves and everything? Well, not necessarily the gloves, but all of the disposable drapes, etc., mm. that's used in our in our hospitals. That's they're all paper with mm. plastic and uh, also the plastic tubing, etc. But those things are all disposable and over the last 25 years when it when they came into mm. existence, the disposables in our hospital Thousands of workers were put out of jobs in the cotton and uh, industry. And are those items, you're saying they're not recyclable because they have a plastic side to them? That's right. Okay. They, mm -hmm. Oh, no, they're, they're paper and plastic. Okay. And I don't know if, you're, if your guests are aware of this tremendous problem. There is tons and tons a day, a day, in okay. disposables out of, the, out of our uh, uh, hospitals. Thank you very Thank much you. for your question. Obviously, the healthcare yeah. sector is growing faster, I think, almost than any other economic sector. So this would be a big issue, yes? It, it sure would, and I, I do not have uh, an but, answer for but that. But something to work on in your community. Yeah. If you see something like this, right, go to the hospital, maybe make an appointment with the CEO, sit down with them and talk with them yeah. about it. 
you know, what are you, what are you going to do exactly. you know, about yeah. this? Um, what are the consequences of not doing anything in your mind, Karen? I, <laughs> you, well, you, I didn't realize you were going to ask me that question. The consequences are so unacceptable to me that I don't go there at all. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, that without the problem, then we're not going to start seeking solutions. So I think putting the problem in front of people is so important because we have this genius, this untapped genius in our society in the form of young people and new ideas that have solutions that we haven't even thought of. So I think putting it out there and seeing what's going to happen is the only alternative we have. And I'm not, I just can't go that other place because then I fall back into despair. So mm -hmm. I, I guess I can't answer that. Well, I've seen your quotes, so I can, I can okay. actually <laughs> quote you. You've said, if we do not rise to this challenge, we will surely unleash upon ourselves the most massive wave of suffering ever experienced in human history. We are drifting towards yes. disaster. Time has run out. Those yes. are so those are your words. Yeah. Uh, it seems kind of doomsday. Well, you see, uh, the, our situation is more serious than we realize because there are yeah. lags built into the process that the real consequences of climate change won't show up for another 20 years or more. And so uh, we are not really seeing the full consequences of what we have already created. And uh, when climate change begins to kick in, when the cost of oil begins to skyrocket and people in, in third world countries are rioting because of the, of the need for food and we're beginning to see civic breakdown, at that point the world is going to be in such deep crisis that we are right. going to be pushed to, uh, to reconsider uh, not doing anything at all. What about the folks who say, hey, you guys were predicting that back in the you know, 60s and 70s that would happen right around now, and it hasn't. Ah, I was saying in 1978, and I've been saying since 1978, it would be the 2020s mm -hmm. when this would happen. So I'm not one of those that was <laughs> predicting near-term difficulties. I just see these bigger terms of population, resources, the environment, and they're very slow trends, but when they converge, and I think they converge in the 2020s, we better wake up and pay attention and be ready to respond. Do either of you put much credence in the folks that are worried about the year 2012? I'm not, so uh, that's not mm -hmm. a real concern of mine, no. Karen? No, it's not a concern of mine either. I'm, I'm hoping that the shift that happens will be a shift in consciousness so people do start paying attention to what they're doing. And, so, you know, the fact that we are in crisis. So let's talk about that for the remaining time that we have left. Some specifics about, about what people can do uh, who are feeling overwhelmed by the situation or frankly some people are underwhelmed by it and yeah. don't think it exists. What are, what, are, what are one or two things that somebody can do right now? Okay, one of the most important things a, a person can do is simply talk to other people because we need to have a collective conversation about what is happening <coughs> in the world and in, in our churches, in our workplaces, in our schools. <coughs> Talk to people. It's the simplest thing that we can do. And then look at your life. The food that you eat, the clothes that you wear, the car that you drive, the work that you're planning to do. Every place in your life is an opportunity for an, a small adjustment here, a small adjustment there, and the sum mm -hmm. total will be significant. Karen, your thoughts? Yeah, my, exactly. Start talking to people. Raise awareness around those issues. Get your own emotions figured out. What is it that you would like to do? What, what is the future that you want to see for your grandchildren? And, and start working toward that. Get in touch with some young people and tap into their dreams. You know, um, The economic situation is forcing a lot of us to look and relook at our situation. Um, and that seems like a very scary thing, but it can also be a very good thing because simplicity, as Duane says, you know, voluntary simplicity is not poverty. It's just a new way of looking at things. Right. I think I've, you've Both written individually and as a community. I think you've written, Mr. Elgin, that the purpose of life is to create a life of purpose. A or life of purpose, yes. And if you look mm -hmm. at the people writing about simpli simplicity of living, they weren't talking about getting rid of things. They were instead talking mm -hmm. about reorienting our lives so they have a higher level of intention, purpose, meaning, and value. Mm -hmm. So would that mean setting aside some time every day to just do nothing, for instance, or just meditate? Or? Well, uh, Indy, what brings us happiness uh, are these experiential sources, and one could be personal growth, the quiet time within. Another is being generous and being of service to other people. Uh, another is just learning and being mm -hmm. quiet at times with nature. So there are these various ways. They don't cost anything. Those are cheap, you know, uh, personal relationships, the quality of those relationships. So uh, we can find uh, satisfaction without the uh, money. Let's try and sneak one more phone call in here. John in Moscow. John, go ahead, please. 
Yes. Go ahead. What can we do to help simplify government regarding spending on non-green programs? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And give an example of what you think uh, is non-green that we spend a lot of money on. Well, there are a variety of them. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, riders on, on legislation that go for spending, like people who give the example of the bridge to nowhere in Alaska. I see. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. That government, in, in, in some senses, for job creation, for instance, we're seeing a ton of money being poured into highways and bridges, you know, which are needed because yeah. they're falling apart. But some would argue, why not public transit? So I think uh, he's wondering, how do, you, how do you reach government on these issues? Right. Well, I, personally, I feel we need a new level of democracy in our society, and the public yes. needs to take back uh, the tools of governance, essentially. And Sandpoint, Transition Sandpoint, is, is an example of that. People coming together at the community level to create new structures of, uh, of governance and moving that community ahead. So people, right. people like to buy things sometimes for comfort. They're filling a gap someplace, or you know, um, why why should they not buy something well, that makes I, them feel good? Yes, um, Gandhi was very clear. He said that people shouldn't give something up until they really, in their heart of hearts, felt like uh, they could let it go with ease. Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel. I'm not here to judge people and tell them what to do, but rather I'm looking ahead to a more positive future and saying, how can we realize that together? And Karen, what's your response to people saying, how can we tell, how can we tell other people in other parts of the world to start doing with less since we've had it all? You know, now they're finally getting their chance in other countries to, you know, get a car or, you know, a washing machine or something like that. We've only got a minute left, so it's maybe not fair, but what's your response to that? <laughs> well, I, I think we need to start with ourselves before we start telling anybody how to do anything. I mean, we really need to stop telling the rest of the world what to do and start setting the example ourselves. Point. In your sense, you've talked about this needs to be a global movement, but again, yeah. some people in other countries say, hey, wait, you know, I'm finally, I can buy something that I want. Yeah, and we're, so we're in a giant struggle for equity, for balance at a global level between our affluence mm -hmm. and, and the desperate poverty of other parts of the world, and it's a, that is the new normal that we're trying to find. Are you optimistic? Right. I, I'm not so much optimistic, I'm hopeful. And I'm hopeful that we can actually turn this around. I think there is grounds for hope. Whether I'm optimistic or not, I don't know. I don't, uh, I'm not terribly optimistic, actually. But I am hopeful. Karen? I am optimistic because I really want to believe in the youth, and I want them to start believing in themselves. Um, because I think together we can help solve that problem, both by changing how we look at what it is that's making us happy, looking at money and energy and how we spend our time in a really thoughtful way because building community, I think, is the answer that we are all seeking. Well, thank you very much. Thank Dwayne you. Elgin, author of Voluntary Simplicity and a native Idahoan. Karen Lanfear, co-founder of the Sandpoint mm. Transition in Initiative. There's a lot more material on our website if you'd like to know more about uh, Mr. Elgin's books or the initiative, the Transition Town Movement. Check it out on our website. That's idahoptv.org and click on Dialogue. Thanks so much. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.